Hello. One family's agony, now a call for action. We meet Brianna's mum, Esther Jai. Brianna Jai was just 16, killed by two other teenagers nearly a year ago. Scarlett Jenkinson had plotted the murder with Eddie Ratcliffe on messaging apps and watched videos of torture and violence on the dark web. Brianna's mum now wants change. I'd like to see mobile phone companies take more responsibility. Um, it's, it's so difficult for parents now to, um, to safeguard their children. Just as the world's biggest tech bosses are confronted by bereaved parents. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? And senators too. I know you don't mean to it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. So we have one big question this morning. What else can we do to protect kids online? How will the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, answer that call? Labour's Peter Kyle joins us from Washington DC in the US, where he's meeting tech bosses this week. And we'll be getting the latest on American and UK strikes in Yemen from Jeremy Bowen in Jerusalem. Morning, morning. With me at the desk for the next hour, Andrea Thompson, the editor-in-chief of Marie Claire, the former Facebook executive, Richard Allen, a Lib Dem, now a member of the House of Lords, and Justine Greening, who was, not so long ago, the Tory Education Secretary too. Before we do anything else, let's start, as we always do, by seeing what's making the news this morning. The Sunday Express and the Sunday People both splash with a verdict from a committee of MPs that the military is not properly equipped to fight a war. The Sunday Telegraph has that story too, and a picture of the, one of the England players who beat Italy in the Six Nations fixture yesterday. Sadly, no image of Scotland's fine defeat of Wales. And the Observer claims Labour is going for a safety first manifesto, but it has a picture of the first nationalist first minister of Northern Ireland who made history yesterday, Michelle O'Neill. She spoke to the BBC earlier, and there's plenty on that important story on the website. But the BBC is leading this morning on the overnight airstrikes by American and UK forces. Jeremy Bowen, our international editor, is in Jerusalem for us, and I spoke to him a short while ago. Well, it's another round of strikes against the Houthis in Yemen who've been attacking the shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, I think it's sending once again a message that Britain, America, and their allies do not want them to do that. However, I've, I've had quite a lot to do with the Houthis over the years and I'm pretty certain they will not be deterred by this that they will be trying to answer it with another attack but coming on top as well of the American strikes against those pro-Iranian targets in Syria and Iraq it has led to another wave of concern that the war well it has spread the issue now is the degree to which this regional war becomes even hotter and more dangerous and whether that can be controlled. And you hear leaders from lots of different countries say repeatedly, we don't want a big major conflict. We don't want to escalate this. We try to keep this under control. But is anybody actually in control? There are so many different actors. No, I don't think anybody is in control of the rate at which this happens. And don't forget, war is messy. Things happen. Perhaps a raid is carefully calibrated, but then it might lead to a response or it might hit the wrong target or it might kill more people than expected and it ratchets up again. Uh, I think, and I've, this is echoed by quite a few Western officials I've spoken to, a lot of it goes back to the war in Gaza. And if a ceasefire could be possible in Gaza, then it might be easier to calm the region down. But while the war in Gaza is going on and while Palestinians are still being killed and while Hamas continue to hold those Israeli hostages, then, if you like, the burner keeps getting hotter in what happens around the region and that of course is something that everybody needs to be concerned about. 
What about the prospects, though, of some kind of deal? There's been a lot of reporting in the last few days suggesting there could be some kind of deal on the way that could actually shift things. What do you think the prospects of that happening soon are? Well, there was a you know, very high-level meeting about a possible ceasefire in Gaza, which was held in Paris, and the head of the CIA was there, along with a number of his counterparts from Israel, from Egypt. The Prime Minister of Qatar was there too. Uh, but as yet, that hasn't led to anything, and there seems to be a pretty big gulf between what Israel wants, which is basically all the hostages out, and what Hamas wants, which is a permanent ceasefire. So no doubt those uh, discussions will be continuing, but it's a, it's a big gulf, and it might be impossible to bridge that gap. What the Americans are hoping, and they've been uh, leaking this and talking about it, is from a ceasefire, a grand bargain, if you like, in the whole region, a bargain which will include uh, the Saudis recognizing Israel, Israel allowing a Palestinian state. But that is an immensely complicated, demanding diplomatic process that even if the first stage started, which is a ceasefire and then a permanent ceasefire, it would require you know, a great deal of luck, everything going right and nothing going wrong. So I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. Jeremy Bowen, thanks so much for joining us from Jerusalem. Thank you. Justine, it's such a complicated jigsaw, but you were in Cabinet when there were some targeted strikes against ISIS. What will people in the British government be thinking about right now and considering? Well, they'll be getting the defence intelligence reports to find out exactly what the assessment of, is of the impact of these strikes. But I think beyond that then, you're left with your next range of objectives and actions and comparing that against the risks of inaction. And I think it's often forgotten that any of these um, routes you might take forward militarily have risks, but there are also risks to not responding to the sorts of attacks that we've seen recently. Such a difficult balancing act, and there'll be lots more reporting on the BBC on that story later through the day. Let's turn now to our main subject this morning. We will hear shortly from Esther Jai, Brianna's mum, but she makes a very powerful call, Richard, to take under 16s off social media to make it much easier for parents to be knowing what's going on online. You worked for Facebook for many years. Is there a need for that? Because the government's just passed a whole new big range of laws in the Online Safety yeah. Bill. I mean, we're at a pivotal moment because we did pass this thing, the Online Safety Act, last year. We've given really extensive powers to Ofcom. Mm -hmm. the, the regulator actually regulates not just the, the internet now, but also mobile phones and telephone companies. We've given them really extensive powers to go and look at the risks on all the platforms and then order the companies to do things to mitigate those risks. It's just starting to roll out. But I think this is a really pivotal moment where we can be optimistic that we have some new tools in the armory. But it's going to take a while, though, before we know if it will make any difference, right? It's going to take a while, but I think the companies will start responding very quickly. Now that they've got a regulator breathing down their necks, it's not up to them anymore. They have to do what they're told to do, or there are some serious legal threats in the legislation. And, Andrea, for your readers at Marie Claire, how much of an issue is this? I think it's a massive issue. I mean, if you're a mother, you know, you have two choices. You either refuse a, a phone or you give your children a phone and you open up the whole internet. And, you know, it's completely unregulated. You know, I'm, I'm editing a platform that, you know, we have Ofcom guidelines, we are regulated, and I don't see why um, other platforms have been so slow um, to adopt regulation. And I feel that this could be a really important step and a much needed step to protect young people. It's interesting to see that you say this is actually a pivotal moment, but whether parents feel like that, I think, you know, remains to be seen and no family in the country, probably none of you watching today won't have been struck by the horror of what happened to Brianna Jai, a 16 year old with her life ahead of her, killed by two other teens almost exactly a year ago. On Friday, her murderers, Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe, were sent to prison for their crime. They'd planned the killing on messaging apps and Scarlett had searched out images of violence and torture on the dark corners of the internet. Now Brianna's mum, an exceptionally courageous and compassionate woman, Esther Jai, wants to try to stop any other family from going through the same experience. She was here yesterday and we started with her telling us what Brianna was like. 
She she was absolutely full of life. She was such a character. She was um, she was really really outgoing. Um, and she just, she loved attention. She loved to be on TikTok. She loved having all of the likes that she used to receive. And um, she was just, she was like life and soul of the party, really. Um, everybody knew Brianna. And um, anybody who ever met Brianna would, would, they would never forget her. You were in court then to hear the sentencing on Friday of the two teenagers who took Brianna's life. Mm -hmm. What was it like being there? Um, it, it was a difficult day. And it was hard to be in the courtroom because up until now we were in a public gallery so we couldn't really see um, both Scarlett and Eddie. Um, I made a conscious effort not to, to look at them both. I didn't, want, I didn't want to see the faces. I didn't want to directly look at them and see what their um, reactions were. I feel that the sentence that the judge gave them was right. I, d I don't think that Scarlett will come out of, of prison ever. I don't think that there's any chance of rehabilitation. So I think that, that the sentencing was correct. She was given a minimum of 22 years. Mm -hmm. Eddie Ratcliffe was given a minimum of 20 years. Do you think you would ever, can you ever imagine a time when you might forgive what they did? I don't carry any hate for either of, either of them because hate is such a harmful emotion to the person that's that's holding that. But with regards to forgiving them, I think that, no, 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 not really. It's incredible to hear you say, though, you carry no hatred towards them. Mm -hmm. Even though they took the life of your daughter, you know, they planned it, they discussed it on messaging apps. You know, that Scarlett had been on the dark web watching videos of violence and torture. And I think you've just shown then again that extraordinary compassion that people around the country have seen in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Scarlett's mother has thanked you for your compassion. I wonder, did you see her in court? Um, I, I, I've, I've seen her, but, but not, we haven't come face to face. But like when I, when I think of their emotions and how they're feeling, it just brings back how I felt um, when all this happened in February. Um, because, yeah, she, she does. She looks completely broken, really, and, and rightly so. She's she's going through an absolutely horrific time. Is there anything that you would want to say to her? Um, I think that I would like to say that um, if she did want to contact me and she does want to speak, then I'm I'm open to that. Um, I'd like to understand more how, like, how their life was and what they, they went through. And I also want her to know that I don't blame her for what her child's done. And I also want her to know that uh, it, I understand how difficult being a parent is in this current, current day and age with technology and, and phones and um, the internet and how hard it is to actually monitor what your child is on. Um, so yeah, if she ever wants to speak to me, I am, I'm here. One of the things you've been extremely careful not to do is to allow Brianna's death to be swept into what's often a very difficult conversation about how transgender people are treated. Mm -hmm. You did say though in your statement to the court that this happened partly because one of the teenagers did have a hatred mm -hmm. for transgender people. Now the court process is complete. Do you believe that played a role? I believe that with Eddie, there was hate there. There was hate for, for trans people. Um, but I also think that he is a hateful boy and I think that he would hate many people regardless. Um, so whether it was, I think it, it was a contributing factor, but um, I, th I think he's just a hateful person. You have shown, I mean, incredible strength in this terrible ordeal that you and your family have been through. But I know now you want to turn your attention to some of the things that you would like to see change mm -hmm. to help other families and other teenagers with the challenges of living in the 21st century. What is it that you would like to change? 
So I'd like to see mobile phone companies take more responsibility. Um, it's, it's so difficult for parents now to, um, to safeguard their children. They carry a mobile phone in their pocket 24 seven. It's a smartphone with the internet, with all of different social media sites. And it's just so difficult to keep on top of what they're doing. Um, so we've set up a petition, um, which we'd like all families and parents to back and sign. We'd like a law introduced so that there um, are mobile phones that are only suitable for un that are suitable for under 16s. Mm -hmm. So if you're over 16, you can have an adult phone, but then under the age of 16, you can have a, a children's phone, which will not have all of the social media apps that are that are out there now, um, and also to um, have software that's automatically downloaded on a parent's phone, which links the children's phone, mm -hmm. um, and it can highlight keywords. So if a child is searching the kind of words that Scarlett and Eddie were searching, it would then flag up on the adult, on the, on the parent's phone. Um, there is software already available. I know that schools are already using this kind of software so that if students do type something in that's concerning, it then flags up to the teachers. I, f I feel like it, it's such a simple solution and I don't understand why we haven't actually done something like this already. Why do you think that's needed? Um, so when, when Brianna was, was with us, she struggled with her mental health and she was... Um, I found out after she was actually on certain social media sites, um, on pro-anorexia sites and um, self-harm sites, which I wasn't aware of. It got to, when Brianna turned around 14, it was so difficult to mon monitor her phone because she wanted that trust and she was, um, she was very protective over her phone. If she couldn't have accessed these sites, she wouldn't have suffered as much. And like I said, they, they carry this phone around 24 seven and I, it's, just not, it's just not doable for a parent to, um, to monitor that. Do you think if some of those safeguards had been in place now, and there was a flagging system that might have picked up what Scarlett and Eddie were searching for, mm -hmm. that Brianna might have been safe? Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that for either one, they wouldn't have been searching that in the first place, and two, if they did search it, then the parents would know and they'd be able to get them some kind of help. One of the other things you'd like to see is teaching kids mindfulness in mm -hmm. schools to help them deal more with the challenges that come to us all. Tell us what you would like to see. And I know also in Warrington, in your town, you've managed already to raise lots of money to mm -hmm. put this in place in local schools. Yes, yes. So we've been, I've been campaigning with the Warrington Guardian to, um, to raise enough money to get a teacher in every school in Warrington trained in mindfulness. It's such an important thing to be taught how to take care of your mental health, how to build mental resilience, and also how to be more empathetic. Like all of these things are skills that you can work on and that you can, um, you can grow. Well, we've got the education secretary on the programme today. I mean, what would you say to Gillian Keegan? Would you want her to make it happen in every school? Yeah, definitely. I think that mindfulness needs to be Really, ideally, we don't need, we shouldn't only have one mindfulness teacher in every school. It should be completely embedded into the school system. And also this week we saw parents in America confront Mark Zuckerberg, the mm -hmm. boss of Meta, which of course owns Facebook and Instagram and lots of those other big apps. If he was here, what would you say to him or other social media bosses? I think that the focus is always on making such a lot of money and not really how we protect people or how we can necessarily benefit society. And I think that greed needs to be taken out of the picture and we need to focus a little bit more on how we can help each other. Um, and yeah, it, it was such a, a powerful thing to see the parents all, all standing up to them. It's, it's quite out of control. I, I heard somebody once call um, like the internet the Wild West, and that's basically what it is, and we've kind of got our children, we threw them in, in the deep end of it, and, um, yeah, some, something needs to change now. 
And I do feel like we, we are potentially at a tipping point where we can make things better. In your statement that you gave to the court, which is full of compassion, full of courage, also obviously you're expressing your, your sorrow, but you also wrote that you felt you failed Brianna by not being able to protect her. Mm. But Esther, no one listening to you today could imagine for a second that you failed her and you speak with such conviction and, and strength. Why do you feel that way? Um, I think that as a parent, like that Brianna's all, all that she, I'm all that Brianna had. I was the one that was supposed to to look after her, and like it was it, as I said before about the issues that she had and the, the struggles that she had. It it was difficult as a parent to 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 go through that with her as well and I think you, you can always look back and wish that you'd done things differently and maybe if I had done things differently then this wouldn't have happened. Next week it's a year and I think you'll be holding a, a vigil. Yeah. Can you share with us what will be the happiest memory that you have or the thing that you and your family remember most fondly, you and your other daughter Alicia? It sounds probably quite daft, but it's just being at home in our pajamas, like just relaxing together with like watching something stupid on TV and eat, eating pizza. That was a favorite food. And like good times don't have to cost anything. And the, the, the best times are the times when you're just completely relaxed and yeah, it's just thinking of her at home and like popping, popping her head in in a little fluffy pink pajamas. You gotta say, Mum, <laughs> Mum, can we have a Domino's pizza? And yeah, it's just just being at home and being with her. And because she was such, she was such a home bird. And she was, she was. I think that's the thing that it's why it was, it, this is why it was so difficult. Because she was just always there. She was always at home. When I came home, she would be home. And that's why the house felt so empty without her. But yeah, the be the best memories are just the simple ones. It's been a huge privilege having you with us in the studio today and sharing your memories. Please come back another time and tell us how your campaign's getting on. Thank Esther, you. thank you so much. Thank you. The remarkable Esther Jai. Well, the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, has been listening to that interview with us this morning. Esther's very clear that she believes mobiles with smart applications, with apps, social media for under 16s, mm. should not be allowed. Mm. It's been floated by the government just before Christmas that you might ban social media for under 16s. Are you actually considering that? Um, well, first of all, that was uh, you know really uh, heartbreaking actually to listen to, and um, actually the strength that she shows is is actually remarkable. And I'm sure I'll um, she'll be a very formidable campaigner um, on this and, and other issues. And you know just just th the whole story is is shocking um, and you know, what, what they were had access to, how it influenced them. And it, it's very sobering, I think, for, for every parent across the country. This is something that parents of this generation are, are grappling with all the time. Um, the children are much more tech savvy, even if you have some of the controls that um, Mrs. G Mrs. Guy was talking about, you still, um, you know, you still know that they could potentially get round them. So, and this is one of the huge focuses of the legislation of the Online Safety Act, which, um, as, as Richard said, is, has got a lot of tools in there um, to try and make this content not be there in the first place, mm -hmm. which is what we're trying to do, but also the age verification part of it to really work. In terms of what we're doing more than that, what we're looking to um, to do is to, is to go one step further and, and ban um, the use of mobile phones in schools. Mm -hmm. There's many schools that do this already, but there's others, again, that feel that this is difficult because it, it does end up being a sort of tussle between the, the child and the teacher or the, or the parent. She, but what she's talking about is something more radical that yes. I think a lot of parents watching might think, actually, yes, why don't we consider this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we make a child-safe mobile phone or ban under-16s from using social media apps? Well, there are child-safe mobile phones available. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the problem is, and I think it's something that um, 
that many parents will recognise is, um, you know, the children are wanting to keep up with their peers and, you know, there's certain groups of parents that sort of all try to agree, we, you know, we won't allow children to have this phone before this age and then they put particular software on there. But it is actually a lot of it is the... Is, is, is it's a massive change uh, over say, this. Over that's this. why some parents believe the government needs to act because it is impossible for them to do it on their own. Yes, which is why we have acted with the Online Safety Act. That is, that is a massive piece of mm -hmm. legislation, um, probably quite a leading position um, that we've taken in really making sure that the, the platforms are accountable for proper age verification and for appropriate things being on uh, and available and inappropriate things most importantly not being there so that act as as we've said is only just starting although the regulators uh, obviously means that people will start to, to to alter their position but are you saying though then that actually what has to happen is wait and see what the new law does and you will not at this stage consider something more radical like banning well, it, social it media is quite phones radical 16s. to ban phones smartphones from from under 16s I, I think that is quite radical even banning it in schools um, you know is quite a quite a big step but that just shows just how much we know, we know and understand that this is really worrying to parents it's worrying also in terms of you know the development of children then building friendships then building those um, you know those social yeah. relationships in school as well um, it, it is a worry because it's something that's relatively new, not something we ever had to deal with, not something the generation, last generation of parents, it's relatively new, so it is a worry. But I think the the steps that we've taken, they have yet to be seen by parents, so, so, so I think we have to live here, them. You're saying, wait, wait and see, nothing more radical on uh, that for now. I, I think the banning on mobile phones in schools mm -hmm. is something that we will be putting guidance on. But is that on. really happening? Because I can also well, hear lots of people shouting at the TV, thinking, well, there's plenty of phones in the playground where my kid goes to school. That's true. That's, so we haven't done it yet, but we're putting the guidance together now, which we'll then consult on. So that is something that's, that we've still got to come as well. And will it definitively happen? Uh, yes, that's what I want to happen. I think it's, it, again, it's empowering head teachers as well as parents to say, look, you know, you should be in school to meet friends, to socialise, to learn all those other skills and to be educated. I mean, obviously, sometimes you can use technology very effectively for education, but that is something that is quite a big step as well. It is a big step. A lot of people... You want, you want it to happen. I do want it to happen. Now, and, and that could help as well in the conversation parents have with their children. Okay. It could help them say, look, if you, if you have this in school, it shows that, you, you know, you shouldn't really be spending all day on, on your phone. Now, one of the issues in this case as the BBC revealed on Friday, is that Scarlett Jenkinson, one of Brianna's killers, was moved to a new school after she had spiked a younger child with a cannabis suite. Brianna's school was not told the full detail of that. Should they have known? I, uh, yes, they should have known. I mean, obviously you should discuss, you know, if children are... I think the Warrington sort of partnership are, are, are doing a review of that, but usually you should be quite open about... I mean, you know, children do have difficulties Ch mm -hmm. children do get into trouble children do um, have to move school for, for one reason or another but of course it is important that um, you know that's done quite transparently and is it the case in your view that the school did not follow the guidance correctly or that the guidance needs to be more explicit that schools must pass on certain types of information I, I don't know that's why the review I think will be quite informative but I know that the the schools within the the, the area have already got that it. underway yes and just before we move on um, one of the other things that Esther Jai wants to see happen is mindfulness lessons introduced mm. even made part of the PGC the primary school teaching qualification would you would you welcome that would you do it well we've been doing a lot because there's a lot of discussion again something um, which is probably something that we're dealing more now than we would have done 10 years ago. But, you know, mental health and taking a whole school approach to mental health. So what we've got at the moment um, is, and, you know, I'm always looking to see what more would make sense. But what we've got at the moment is senior mental health leaders being trained in every school across the country. So there's a grant available from the government to, for that mm -hmm. training. We've also got mental health support teams being rolled out to schools, primary and secondary across the country. And, and a about lot of people would say there's not enough funding for that, but it's just a, it's a simple request. Well, it's actually Esther, not. Would, would you consider 
mindfulness being taught well, on the curriculum? We don't actually set the curriculum, each head teacher does. So we have a very autonomous, mm. uh, there's a lot of autonomy in our schools. So we have the senior mental health lead, so they can come up with a whole school approach. Mindfulness may be part of that. Other aspects, uh, you know, of group therapies and stuff may be part of that. But if the education that. secretary said she'd like it to happen... I haven't done it, it would, myself, it would... actually, um, mindfulness. Um, it's something, they, there's, there's actually a group in Parliament that do it. And I'm always determined to go, but uh, I haven't yet uh, been to it. But I think the most important thing is this, this, this focus on mental health and helping with children's mental health. We know that that causes a lot of anxiety. Mm. We know that it's a very difficult time for children. It's much more difficult, uh, I think, growing up in a mm. world with access to all of this mm -hmm. online content. Um, you know, you, you look at every, everybody's lives on there. I mean, it mm. is a really difficult world. And very different. Um, and I, and I, I do think, you know, mental health, the, the mental health support teams in schools, that they are rolling out. We will get to 50% of pupils by you know this time next year but okay. it does take time to train because mm -hmm. you've got obviously you've got clinical psychologists and you've got well, people who well, are well talking of training then let's talk about your plan to have an apprenticeship scheme for teachers now your department has told us you did a grade four in maths and english which is the old c to get onto the course um in your gcses is that enough or is your apprenticeship scheme potentially looking at sort of teenagers with not particularly stellar qualifications being paid less than the normal minimum wage because they're an apprentice teaching children. No, what this is, is 70% of the occupations in this country you can now access via an apprenticeship. So that's something that the Conservative government has put in place since 2012. And it is actually a bit of a game changer because there are not only many more occupations, you know, whether it's a financial analyst or a nuclear scientist or a space engineer or a lawyer, a doctor, pretty much everything you can name, you can do now, but also they're for all ages. So for young people to get into professions and for people to retrain or to get a second shot. And one of the ones that's one of the last ones is actually teaching. I wanted to do it when I was the apprenticeships and skills minister, but I didn't manage to get it through. But what it will do is there's three main cohorts. The first is young people who want to go into teaching but want to skip the student debt. So all the apprenticeships are on UCAS now. So you can see the various paths to the same destination. And that will be the same destination. This is a maths teaching degree that we're starting with. So it has a lot of subject content of maths. But the second uh, group of people are people who either want to shift career mm -hmm. later on and go into teaching, give something back. A lot of people say that. Or our brilliant teaching assistants. We've got 59,000 more teaching assistants than we had. And some of them may want to go and progress into teaching. But is it about, though, getting teachers on the cheap? Because Absolutely apprentices, not. No, but they are paid less. We are the people who put in our manifesto that we wanted the teacher's starting salary to be £30,000. And I was delighted to be the Secretary of State that delivered on that this September. So there's absolutely no way. We just want to broaden the routes so that... Because the routes at the moment mean you've got to take three years without earning and take it on a student loan. Well, for some people... That's not possible. Mm -hmm. I was teaching, I was talking to some social worker degree apprentices last week. All of them said, I need to earn money. I have a family. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was a care worker herself. It broadens access to it's a care leaver, her say. It just broadens access so mm -hmm. that, you know, no matter where you are in life, you can get on. And it's, I think our apprenticeship system is really the jewel in the crown and will help us grow our economy going forward. And I know forward. that you were an apprentice as well when you were starting out in business. I'm the only the... degree apprentice in the House of Commons, so you can imagine <laughs> how passionate I am. Because, yeah, I left school at 16. I went to a comprehensive school in Knowsley. 92% of the kids left without the four or five GCSEs. Most of them could have gone anywhere in life. So these barriers we need to be overcoming all the time. And a degree apprenticeship does that. And I'm delighted that more and more people are talking about apprenticeships. And it's really, really important. And we need to stick with the plan, by the way. What's also Because Labour will halve them. What, That's what they've what's said. What's also important to people watching is childcare. Now, yes. the government's made a big promise when parents of two-year-olds are meant to get 15 hours of free childcare a week from April. Uh, we're short of time, but can you give a guarantee to our viewers this morning that anyone who wants that will get it? Yeah, I, look, we've been doing this plan to make sure that we can deliver it. I am pretty confident that we can deliver it. it pretty actually, confident is not a guarantee. Uh, well, of course, we're working through thousands thousands of business, but we have actually put this in place. I know working parents want it. It will save them £6,500. Again, it's a plan that we will deliver, and it's something that I think most parents are waiting and working hard to make sure it happens. I've delivered lots of things. I'm very confident that this will be delivered. Very confident and pretty confident. So you're on the record saying that. Um, yes. Before we move on, I must just last 
lastly ask you about these latest strikes in Yemen. Mm. Uh, there have been various strikes by Britain and America over the last week, uh, last few weeks against Yemeni targets. But attacks in the Red Sea keep going. It doesn't look like they're working. Well, they are targeted and they take different targets each time. So I think the launchers, there's been some underground storage. But, you know, we have to protect the freedom of navigation and we have to protect, uh, well, the ships and our, and our Navy in that region. So they are targeted and they want to basically do this to get rid of the capabilities that the Houthis have. And, you know, obviously, as they find a capability, they'll target to try and get rid of it. And that is that is the approach. But it is very targeted. OK, Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary. It's great to have you with us in the studio for the first time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, what did you think of what the Education Secretary had to say? Um, and do also let us know what you made of Esther Jai's call for radical action um, to change how kids are able to access the internet. You can email me, koonsberg at bbc.co.uk, or if you're social media inclined, you can use the hashtag. Um, Andrea, firstly to you, um, we saw incredible strength and compassion from Esther. Do you think her idea of something as radical as a, a ban on social media apps for kids is, is something that your readers and people would like to see? I think so, yes. I mean, when children have a mobile phone, they are, you know, um, opening themselves up to all sorts of online platforms that, you know, there's a lot of um, extreme violence, um, self-harm. Uh, the lack of regulation means that parents are just struggling to cope. And I think there'll be a lot of, you know, a lot of grassroots support for this. Um, it's much needed, much overdue. Mm. And, you know, I think it's a step that needed to be taken. A lot of social media platforms work on an algorithm, so our children are being served extreme content. Extreme content, when it's engaged with and controversial, is pushed to the top of the feed, making it more visible for young people. So actually, often, it's really harmful content that they're seeing first. There is, though, this big new chunky bit of legislation, and we heard Justine there, the Secretary of State, basically saying, we've got to wait and see what effect that has before considering anything more radical. If you were doing her job now, what would you think of, of where they've got to? Will it be enough? I think it's a, a really important step forward, the online um, safety bill. But I think if you, if, you, if you think we're in a world where yesterday we didn't have these phones, mm -hmm. and then today we've got what we've got, and all of the harm that we're seeing, not just... Um, just in relation to that very extreme harm, but this long tail of bullying, depression, mental health issues, we'd say, let's ban it. We'd say this is, this is like cigarettes, it's like alcohol. You'd never allow children to go into a shop and buy a porn magazine. And I do think it's been the creeping technology in a sense that has slightly muddied our, our clarity on this legislation. So I actually do think it is time to look at this. I think if the tech companies do inevitably find it hard mm. to do the regulation and that that tech will change, maybe the safest way is to say up until 16, there isn't an access to It's not to, a very conservative thing to call for them though. I mean, your party traditionally doesn't like banning things. Nobody likes banning things, but if it's the right thing to do, mm. and, and I think Brianna's mother said, it's so hard to safeguard a child as a parent. If, if the parent feels like that, then we have to take, I think, a really fresh look at this and be prepared to do what it takes more broadly to help keep children safe. Is it realistic, though, Richard? So you worked at Facebook for a long time. You started at Facebook, I think, 2009. That's right. But you're <coughs> also a politician, so you know all these different dilemmas, and actually you're uh, part of a documentary that's on um, Sky Documentaries, which shows that the interesting, it looks at the interesting evolution mm. of all of this, and it features a very young Mark Zuckerberg and talks about his evolution into the king of the metaverse. Is it realistic? to talk about something as radical as a ban. Mm. Uh, I mean, we use a lot of analogies for the tech companies. I actually think um, vehicles, cars, is actually one of the most appropriate ones. Okay. Look, there, there are people inside the tech companies who are doing the equivalent of developing the digital seat belts and the airbags and the things we need to keep them safe. But their voices are much quieter than those who want the car to go faster, who want it to be shinier. And we need to redress that balance. And so all the ideas like, like uh, Esther put forward, they're already, I think, being considered in the companies. Really? What the regulation will do is tip over that balance of power so the people arguing for the safety features will, will be saying, look, it's not whether or not we want to have a seatbelt. We have to have one or Ofcom's going to come after us. 
Will it, though, a British regulator really be able to take on these, you know, huge titans? I mean, this week, you know, your old colleague, Nick Clegg, who now works at Meta, we saw emails that he had sent that were published in the States with him appealing to Mark Zuckerberg for more help, more support people to work on safety. And he was turned down. It didn't happen. Again, I think that's an example of exactly that dynamic. Look, a lot of the people who work for the company in the UK for years have been flagging that there are issues. I think the regulator does make a difference. There are some really onerous things that companies will have to do if they want to keep serving children in the UK. And that's in the bill. And they'll have a choice. They could get out of the UK market or they could get their act together. Those are the only two choices. They haven't got a choice to carry on as they are under this legislation. And I think we will actually see some services withdrawing from serving children in the UK because oh, really? they'll find it too difficult. Yeah. The ones who have, you know, sexualized content, for example, uh, they won't be able to do that anymore. So they either have to make sure they can get rid of it all and prove to Ofcom that they have, can't hide, can't lie. They have to give Ofcom the information they need or they get out of the UK market. Do you think uh, that's reassuring enough, Andrea, to parents and families listening to that or you know it's people themselves because so many of adults are completely addicted to their phones you know this is a huge has a huge impact on all of society not just on children yeah i mean i think that you know more needs to be done globally mm -hmm. um perhaps we need global regulation it's maybe not enough just to do it nationally um you know they are global companies you know i i we're all part of companies that are putting out information in the uk to a set number of people you know a certain million these are companies that are speaking to every child across the world um, and have the power to influence them. And I think global regulation um, may be something that, that needs to happen. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, the, the U EU and the UK are both regulated, yeah. but a big missing piece of the jigsaw is the US, where many of the companies are hosted. And again, I think we saw that again this week. A lot, a lot of heat, but very little actual and action from a legislative point of view in the US. There were very dramatic Senate hearings yeah. in the US this week, where Zuckerberg was accused of having blood on his hands. But we still seem to be a long way from actually getting a US Online Safety Act, and mm -hmm. that, I think, would be a, another game changer. Let's talk about what the government hopes will be a game changer to childcare. So we heard the Education Secretary there say she was pretty confident and then very confident that any parent in England who wants their free childcare from April will get it. Um, but Justine, you, you've introduced a fair few child care proposals in your time in government. Do you think it's going to work? I think it's going to be very challenging. Um, and I think it's a key test of competence for Rishi Sunak's government. So. As Gillian Keegan rightly set out, the difficulty is you're working with thousands and thousands of individual childcare providers. But I do think um, it, it feels to me like there's a lot of catch up going on mm. at the Department for Education. And let's hope, because this is a, an important policy step forward, that parents are able to access that 33 hours of childcare that, that they've been promised. And Andrea, how much do people need it? <laughs> Um, I think, going from, I mean, from our readership, you know, I mean, it's a really, it's a big issue. Um, we did a survey and over 70% of um, women admitted that they'd put off having children because of the cost of childcare. 70%? Yeah, and, you know, it's, um, what it, the knock-on effect is to be seen in all of our workplaces. Women are dropping out of their workforce at really key points in their careers. Um, they're not going for promotions because the childcare just isn't there. Um, and I wonder whether they've actually spoken to parents about, mm. about this because, you know, it's 38 weeks a year and I don't know many parents that work 38 weeks a year. You know, <laughs> we, we need wraparound care. Um, we certainly need more than 15 hours, which is the first proposal. You know, I um, remember struggling to, mm. to, 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 to work full time with that. And a lot of people just don't go back to work um, because it's just not worth their time. Okay. Um, once, once they've paid that, 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 those childcare fees. Well, the proof will be in the pudding. Big new plan meant to be coming in in April. Let's see if it works out. And of course, you can always tell us what your experiences have been um, and whether or not you are trying to get that free childcare. So a few minutes ago, we heard so powerfully from Brianna Jai's mum calling for under 16s to be stopped from using social media apps and much tougher controls to keep children safe online. Her demand comes just days after that extraordinary hearing we just talked about in Washington, D.C., where Mark Zuckerberg, the chief executive of Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, was, as we said, accused of having blood on his hands. He apologised to parents who said their children had been harmed by social media, saying no one should have to go through what they had endured. 
Well, let's speak to Peter Kyle, who's Labour's Shadow Technology Secretary. He's in Washington now and is meeting tech companies this week. Thanks for joining us. It must be very early in the morning. Um, we are discussing all of these difficult issues this morning. Is a ban on social media for under 16 something that Labour might consider? I'm open-minded about how we go forward about this, and I'm already in discussion with bereaved families who have lost children to the impact that social media or that social media has had an aggregating factor uh, in, in the loss of life and the harm that's done to them. But what we need to do is we've got to make sure all the powers that already exist are in place as quickly as possible. Uh, the instructions that are going to come out of Ofcom as a result of the Online Safety Act aren't going to go live until the end of this year. It's taken five years for this bill to get onto statute. It took far too long. It was paused over the last leadership election for the Conservatives and Kemi Badenoch calling it legislating for hurt feelings. So we really need to get a grip on the challenge we have right here. I'm open-minded about how we go forward. There are other things we could do quite quickly. For example, the Secretary of State for Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, by, by this legislation, can issue a, a strategic statement to Ofcom which, which, it, which forces it to prioritise looking at certain issues. Mm. Uh, and I think the role of the dark web, uh, the pathway in particular that people take from uh, social media into the dark web is something that Ofcom should be looking at. I'm engaging with bereaved families to see whether this is something, a tool that could be used. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm open-minded as to using it, um, should Labour take office this year, very soon into a Labour government. But is that something you believe now, the Technology Secretary, your opposite number, Michelle Donnellan, should do? Should she now use that power to get Ofcom to look at how you can access the dark web from social media apps? Should that happen now? Why wait? Uh, well, all I can do is prepare a programme of government because we're in an election year and that's what I'm preparing for and I've already been engaging with bereaved families about this as to what powers can be used quickly to protect young people from uh, the, the, what happens on the dark web, the darker side of it. But also, Laura, let me just say this. It took five years to get the Online Safety Act uh, uh, into statute. Legislators, regulators, but also social media companies were far too late for, uh, for this. But there are other things coming down the line. The reason that I'm here in Washington is because AI, uh, chatbots, but also deep fakes, they're on the horizon in the power and the influence these are going to have uh, over society, over vulnerable people, but also particularly on young people. We need to start getting ahead of the curve on this. So in, the, in part of preparing a programme of government to put to the electorate, uh, the next election. I'm looking very carefully at how we can get ahead of the curve so that when these things uh, wash over our society, we are prepared, we have the regulation, the legislation and the relationship with the tech companies so that we can, and also our international partners, so that we can work together to make sure that the harm that could come from it is mitigated before the harm actually starts to have an impact. But in terms of what we know happens right now, when the online laws were going through Parliament, Labour said that there was an important provision that the government took out that should go back in. So Labour said at that point that legal but harmful content online for adults should also be outlawed. Do you still believe that and would you still look at that if you win the next election? Uh, I, I'm already looking at that and intensively uh, understanding how harmful but legal content and the impact it has. I'm not sure it needs to be brought into the same scope as, as other parts. But also, Laura, there is a piece of legislation going through the House of Lords at the moment and the government have introduced a legislation which just weeks, I mean weeks after the Online Harm Act went live, they're watering down one key part of it which is the power that coroners have to demand and sanction uh, or demand information from tech companies and the tech companies can't resist releasing that information to the coroner. Well a uh, an amendment has just gone down from the government to remove and water down that right. We are resisting it and we must resist all attempts to water down the powers coroners, uh, Ofcom and other statutory bodies and investigatory bo bodies have to hold tech companies to account so they can release information about the impact it's having on young people. We understand actually that coroners will get that power to force companies to release information after campaigning from the bereaved families. But I just wonder, this week, dramatically, where you are in Washington, Mark Zuckerberg was accused of having blood on his hands. Do you agree with that? 
Uh, I think that tech companies bear response, a lot of the responsibility. Uh, I think legislators and regulators were also behind the curve, but I think the primary uh, the, the primary uh, blame does rest with the people developing this technology because they knew before anyone else the impact it could have. They saw the coding, they saw they designed the algorithms. Uh, don't forget, you know what what, what we learned from Brianna's case in the last few weeks is that the the, peop the, the two youngsters that killed her uh, were interacting online and expressing some violent thoughts online on social media. Now what the algorithms do is match people with similar concerns, similar um, language together. The algorithm brings people together who share um, that certain values. So it's clear that social media is bringing together people with harmful values, potentially on a journey towards criminal activity. Um, and, then not, and they might, might well have known this way ahead of, uh, way ahead of time. We need to make sure that where there is the potential for harm, tech companies are, throw, are throwing open the doors so we can have transparency. We can work together to mitigate these harms before they wash over society, which is what's happening at the moment. And we see something similar, the potential at the moment, with the way that AI is going in some of its real frontier um, technology that's emerging. That's why we will move from a, from a voluntary code to a statutory code so that those companies engaging in that kind of research and development have to release all of the, the test data and tell us what they are testing for so we can see exactly what is happening and where this technology is taking us. And just to be really clear on what that actually means, if people aren't familiar with a lot of the jargon around this debate, you're saying that you would, if you were in government, if you were lucky enough to win the election, you would force companies working particularly in artificial intelligence to publish their data, to publish what they're doing in their hard drives, what they're doing in the back end of their systems? Uh, indeed, we would move to a, yeah, we would compel by law uh, those test data results to be released to government so that the AI Safety Institute set up by Rishi Sunak can scrutinise, can, can look at exactly what the implications are and just reassure the public that independently we are scrutinising what is happening in some of the real cutting edge parts of the technology development when it comes to artificial intelligence. Because don't forget, some of this technology is going to have a profound impact on our workplace, on our society, on our culture. And we need to make sure that, it, that that development is done safely and that where there are implications, the government is there and the regulators are there to make sure that we're guiding them. We don't want to stop this development. And if there is stuff that's happening that is morally and ethically challenging, I would rather it was done in a country like Britain with a Labour government so that we can have oversight. It is enhancing of our democratic uh, values as a country and not damaging to it as it could be if it's done elsewhere. So we have to have these relationships. We've got to be honest about where legislation can make a difference. But we also have to work with countries like America and the, the administration here so that we can have a regulatory environment which crosses all international boundaries, not just trying to pretend we can solve this problem alone back home. Peter Cowell, thank you so much for joining us from Washington, where I think it is extremely early in the morning. So we're grateful to you for staying up and being sure to sleep. I hope you've got some coffee there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Washington. Um, interesting there to hear just the extent of this challenge it's not often where you hear people politicians any politician talking about a need for you know global regulation as you suggested Andrea Richard he said we've got to get ahead of the curve and regulate for AI I think some people might be watching and thinking if you looked at what's happened in the last 10 years you've got to think governments don't have a, have a chance of doing that I mean I think they do with the warning signs are there I, I remember back in 2010 one of my first jobs at Facebook was to go out and tell politicians that Facebook might be relevant for elections. I don't think you need to tell them that anymore. And we know that there are some very concrete issues like fake information being pushed out in election time. And we could legislate for that now. We, we can play whack-a-mole getting it off the internet. But we could also have, amend our election laws and say, look, any, any politician who uses this kind of material will disqualify them. And that's a really like good way of stopping it at source. Would you like that to happen? I'd love to see that happening. We haven't updated our election law for the internet age. And that's something, again, I'll put on, on the agenda now, uh, rather than wait until we've had an election that, where there are questions and then do it afterwards. So you're a real poacher turned gamekeeper. Uh, absolutely. On or this the other one. way around. Maybe. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, let's find solutions. And, and again, I, it was really interesting to hear Esther's talk about finding solutions. Ian Russell Simley, you know, he's really Lord focused Russell. on finding solutions. So. You know, that's what we need to be looking at. Less of the, you know, just, just talking vaguely about the dangers and more of the zooming in on, let's try this, let's try that. And if not, 
what else could we do? For politicians and for the public, they're looking at you know artificial intelligence and AI and you know sometimes called the rise of the robots. I mean, the tension here for politicians is difficult, isn't it? And for all of us, because there are such massive opportunities and positives. If AI can look at a thousand cancer scans a day instead of individual members of staff only being able to look at far fewer, but how can governments balance the risks and the opportunities, Justine? I think it is important because we are at risk of not accessing those opportunities because the focus is so much on the risks. But I think the point that Peter Carl made was a really interesting one, you know, a sensible one, a bit like food manufacturers having to absolutely share the ingredients mm -hmm. with regulators. Why shouldn't tech companies have to be more transparent around the coding so that we can build up a real sense of where risks lie? And I suspect this is where legislation will go. I think the online safety bill is a really important step forward and, and I think it, everyone should welcome it. But I think what we're discussing today is the fact that that's part of how you create a safer world, particularly for our children, mm -hmm. but it's not sufficient. And I think it's about getting that right balance between regulation of harmful activity, but allowing a tech sector that can really provide benefits to wider society from being able to get on and do that innovation. There is a big concern about jobs going. I mean, just briefly, Andrew, are you worried about the rise of the robots coming for coming for your jobs, coming for, for magazine editors or for, you know, dare I say it, television journalists? I, mean, I think that there is, there is so much positive stuff um, to be gained from AI. You know, it's going to have a huge impact on productivity. Um, I think it, it, it'd be really useful for research. Um, I do... Um, feel that you know a human will need to be involved for you know the the final part of the process um, certainly what we do know is that um, google really um, ranks very expert content tested content and we pride ourselves on trying to do that and actually we do not write our content with ai for that reason so the robots aren't so the writing you. Doesn't well that's very good i'm <laughs> pleased to hear it because we don't want anyone to replace our panel today you were all absolutely excellent with your insight thanks so much for joining us today because we're coming up to the end of the show. So let's go back to the beginning. We spoke to Esther Jai, who of course lost her daughter, murdered by two teenagers, Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe. Esther wants mobile phone companies to do more to keep children safe online. But she had this message for Scarlett's mother. I would like to say that um, if she did want to contact me and she does want to speak, then I'm, I'm open to that. Um, I'd like to understand more how like how their life was and what they they went through and I also want her to know that I don't blame her for what her child's done. Thank you so much indeed for getting in touch today. Maybe we'll share some of your emails on today's newscast. I'll be joining Paddy O'Connell shortly to record the Sunday episode of Newscast and that will be on BBC Sounds later on. A huge thanks to my panel, Andrea, Richard and Justine. And our huge thanks go to Esther Jai for sharing her story and being so open about her frustrations and anxiety about what kids see online that we know is shared by so many families in a world that is changing so fast. Politicians here have come up with a new way of writing the rules, the online safety bill, a new major law. But it's far from certain it could stop the worst happening again. And there's a question too as over if it can keep up with the dizzying shifts in technology. We know it's one of the trickiest issues the country faces, so do share your experiences and we will come back to that issue soon. You can, of course, catch up with anything you missed on iPlayer or if you're a traditional teletype, I'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place.